Good afternoon to you all. It's a pleasure to have you on the second series of the graduate seminar from the graduate program on the School of Chemical Engineering of the State University of Campinas. Uh, for the second series of seminars, we have the pleasure to have on board Tassia Lins da Silva Quaresma, who is, who is a uh, student of the graduate program, and she's a chemical engineer. She got her degree from the Federal uh, Fluminense University in Rio, more precisely in Niterói. Um, Tasia is a well-experienced engineer in risk analysis and numerical combustion modeling, particularly with emphasis on computational fluid dynamics. And she has contributed to several risk analysis methodologies on oil and gas industry, and also on the mining industry. Currently, she has been studying combustion uh, models for turbulent mixing flames, focused on the turbulent flame interaction in order to predict flame speed and its consequences. So, without any further ado, please join me and welcome Tasia to her presentation. It's up to you, Tasia. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Professor. So, uh, good afternoon. Thank you all for watching. My name is Tasia Quaresma. Um, I'm a chemical engineer, and today I'm going to talk about explosions modeling, the turbulence flame interaction, and its challenges to the modeling of turbulent premixed combustion. This topic is part of my research project which is supervised by Professor Dr. Savio Viana. So this presentation will cover the following topics. I will start uh, with accidental gas explosions in industry, which is actually the motivation of my um, investigation. Uh, speaking a little bit more about the phenomena involved, I will introduce and describe the turbulent premixed combustion. Um, then I will talk about the effect of turbulence on a turbulent, uh, on a premixed combustion. The numerical modeling, how do we translate the natural phenomena into mathematical equations? Um, I'm going to talk about the computational fluid dynamics tool I have used I've been using um, to conduct this investigation. This is called Stokes. I will also present uh, some results I have obtained so far, future work and acknowledgements. So the main motivation of my work is the occurrence of accidental gas explosions in industry. And as an illustration, I brought the Bunsfield vapor cloud explosion that took place in England in 2005. And in Bunsfield, there was a um, storage depot um, uh, with many tanks that storage petrol, uh, petrol. And after a sequence of failures in the level control systems, system of one of the tanks, the tank overfilled, um, causing a sequence of explosions and a fire that caused a significant financial loss and left uh, leaving over 40 people injured. So accidents such as this normally follows a sequence of events that starts with an accidental release of a flammable material that vaporizes, dispersing, uh, disperses within the air because of the action of the wind, um, forming a flammable cloud that in the presence of an ignition. In other words, uh, what we are describing here in a more um, uh, phenomenologically terms, uh, the flammable cloud is actually a um, mixture of fuel and atmospheric air that are premixed before um, 
before encountering the ignition source. And the explosion is called a turbulent premixed combustion. So in an explosion event, the promotion of flame acceleration due to turbulence generated from the obstacles is responsible for many severe damages. So as we know, in the proximity of a wall, the flow velocity tends to zero, which uh, generates high velocity gradients. And this effect is intensifies the turbulent flow field that interacts with the flame, increasing its speed uh, increasing the speed at which the flame propagates. And as we know, the flame speed determines the level of severity of the damages. So now speaking a little bit more of the turbulence flame interaction, um, turbulent fields of mild intensity, low and mild intensity acts to wrinkle and stretch the surface of the flame. So the distorted surface has its surface area increase, increased, uh, which enhances the diffusive transport of heat and mass through the flame surface. So on the right-hand side here, we have a representation of the turbulent premixed flame which is propagating towards the unburned reactant mixture, um, consuming them continuously as it moves and leaving behind the products of the combustion reaction. Uh, the flame region is actually uh, where the combustion reaction takes place. And these elements here represent the turbulent flow field and they are called eddies. So those eddies here, they are rotating. And as you can see, we have eddies of different sizes, of different length scales. Each one of them are constantly interacting uh, in a different manner with the surface of the flame. Um, and also, the formulation we are describing here assumes that even though um, turbulence wrinkles the surface of the flame, it does not affect the local structure of the flame, uh, which locally remains laminar. And this is the basis of the so-called laminar flamelet formulation, where the turbulent remixed flame is composed of many laminar flamelets. So the phenomena is described numerically by the governing equations. Here we have a generic transport equation with the transient, the convective, the diffusive, and the source terms that has been written here for a generic variable phi. And phi can be mass, energy, momentum, turbulent properties. And most importantly, because we are dealing with a reacting flow, we would also have a transport equation for each species um, involved in the combustion reaction. But let's remember that these equations here do not have an elliptical solution. And because of that, they are normally solved with uh, numerical methods. They're so numerically uh, by the computer. So this is actually what computational fluid dynamics is all about, right? CFD. And in CFD, we have a large number of equations of this kind being solved simultaneously, uh, which is something computationally expensive. Um, depending on the complexity of the phenomena we have, the simulation time can last from hours to even months. So in order to decrease the computational effort, the combustion reaction here will be simplified. 
instead of having one transport equation to each species involved in the reaction, we end up with only one equation. This will be discussed in detail uh, in a bit. Um, and I would like you to pay attention to the source terms, to the source term of the species transport equation. In most practical uh, cases of combustion modeling, this term is not calculated with the Arrhenius law. Um, instead, the source term or the reaction, the, the rate of reaction, as you prefer, is modeled in a way of accounting for the effects of turbulence on the reaction. So under the assumption that the flame interface is thin, the combustion reaction is simplified as uh, reactants yield products. And the whole combustion reaction can be represented by a single variable C, which is called the reaction progress variable, which is assigned to be zero in the reactants region and equals unity in the products region. This formulation allows for the number of species uh, transport equations to be reduced to only one equation. There are a few uh, commonly approaches for the modeling of the combustion reaction rate. The eddy breakup, or EBU, assumes the combustion to be fully controlled by turbulence. In the flame surface density ap approach, the term related to the flame area is, transport, is transported instead of the progress variable C. We also have fractal theories that consider the flame surface to be a fractal. Uh, and the bray moss libby reaction rate model, which is based on the flamely crossing frequencies um, that we are going to see in more detail in a bit. And this, these approaches here are often combined with some initial phase modeling, which considers that in the beginning of the propagation, the flame is laminar. So talking a little bit more about the BML reaction rate model, which is the object of my research work, it has been developed using a physical argument. So let's imagine that this curve here, this curved line here, uh, represents the surface of the flame. If we were to insert a probe inside the flame at a fixed location, at a fixed position of the space, because the flame is thin, the probability of this probe detecting or finding either reactants and products here are much higher than finding the flame itself, right? Because the flame is assumed to be thin. So the high probability of finding either reactants or products are represented by two direct delta functions at C equals zero and C equals one. And another function in between denotes the probability of finding the flame region. But unfortunately, uh, the BML model has some limitations regarding the number of constants that need to be adjusted. And also, unclosed terms um, that require further modeling. W here is the source term that is modeled as a function of the reactor reactants density, the laminar flamelet speed, the stretch factor, and the flame uh, surface area to, volu to volume ratio sigma. Sigma here accounts for the progress variable variation, and the, the effect of turbulence is accounted within the length scale of wrinkling L hat. 
This function f here is normally calculated by empirical correlations that relate the turbulence intensity, u prime, and the laminar flamelet speed, ul. And the use of empirical correlations is somewhat undesired because they add more constants to, to the equation, which also need to be tuned or adjusting depending on the, the geometry you have. So alternatively, uh, a fractal approach is used to model sigma and it relates the turbulent length scales from the largest to the smallest eddy that has sufficient energy uh, um, to wrinkle the flame surface, right? This approach usually depends on only one adjustable constant, Df here, which is the fractal dimension. So one of the research lines we have been investigating is coming up with a BML hybrid that replaces the normally used empirical correlation in the function f by the fractal approach that relates the range of turbulent length scales that are re responsible for wrinkling the flame. So this way, L hat here is directly related to the length scales of turbulence, and the number of adjustable constants is also reduced. So um, the combustion model is implemented in an in-house developed CFD codes code that is called Stokes, Shock Towards Kinetics Explosion Simulator. And Stokes solves the full set of Navier-Stokes equation, equations, right, in all the three directions in, of space. Uh, Stokes uses the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes approach for uh, turbulence. The central different scheme is used as a discretization method. The method oscillations are smoothed out by an artificial viscosity. Time advance is um, performed with a fourth order Runge-Kutta method. And of course, the combustion model applied is the BML. So if you want to know more, you can refer to the original publications by Ferreira and Viana. So as case studies, we have considered two partially obstructed combustion chambers, A and B here. The first one contains initially a stoichiometric mixture of propane and air. Um, and it is obstructed by a single cubic obstacle that is positioned 100 millimeters from the bottom of the chamber. Uh, and in the second chamber, we have methane and air and three rectangular obstacles that are 100 millimeters apart from each other with the first one also 100 positioned uh, at 100 millimeters from the bottom of the chamber. And this red um, point here represent the ignition source. So the ignition is located at the bottom of the chamber. All the walls here are solid walls. They are closed except for the top of the chamber, which are open. So as a first result, we have here the flame position inside the combustion chamber at different time steps 
And here we compare it, the Stoke simulation implementing the BML hybrid, right? The proposed BML hybrid with experimental results. So as you can see, we have a very good agreement of the flame counter propagating towards the reactants. In the Stokes simulation here, we can observe from the color scale that the progress variable PV here is unity in the products region, right? And um, the unburned reactants PV is zero, which is this black region here. So if we plot the flame position inside the, the chamber against time, we will, we will come up with this graph here on the left hand side. So in the first chamber, we know the obstacle is 100 meters from the bottom of the chamber. So we can observe an increase on the rate of change of the flame position around 100 millimeters, which is where the flame passes over the obstacle. This effect becomes more evident when we analyze the flame speed here where a peak of speed is observed uh, when the flame passes over the obstacle and another peak on the flame speed can be observed uh, when the flame bursts out the chamber. And also we have compared here uh, the BML hybrid, which is proposed um, in my research work with experimental results from literature and another simulation that uses uh, a classical correlation for the function f. We see that the BML hybrid approach achieved a significant improvement when compared to the BML using the correlation for both the flame position results and the flame speed. So now uh, we have the results of flame position again in, at different time steps in the chamber, now containing methane in air with three rectangle, rectangular obstacles. Um, <clears throat> compared here with the experimental result. And again, we can clearly see the flame surface flowing over the obstacles, moving towards the reactants mixture and leaving behind the products. So comparing the simulation uh, with the proposed, sorry, um, comparing the results from the proposed BML hybrid with the, the BML simulation using the classical correlation, we can see an improvement on the, on the curve trend for both flame position and flame speed. And here we can also observe how the flame speed changes when it passes over an obstacle, right? So looking at this graph on the right-hand side here, the Rectangular obstacles are positioned at 100, 200, and 300 millimeters. And we can clearly observe three peaks of flame speed when passing over the obstacles. Um, future work is focused on simulating large scales geometry and external flows. So if you wanna know more, um, you can consult the following works I have um, used to, to come up with this presentation. I would like to thank my sponsors for the financial support.
and that's it for now. Thank you. And I'm out. And now I am open to questions. Thank you very much, Tasia. I'm very proud of you and very happy that you managed to put together such a lovely presentation. And for those students who are following us on the YouTube, this is a very good opportunity to practice your English and also to get some grips on the reality of the research and how to put together a presentation and realize things are not that complicated, in fact. So, uh, as there's no such thing as free lunch, there's a couple of questions here for you, Tasia. Uh, so, um, some of them were sent to me in Portuguese, so I'm trying to, to translate them. Uh, so the, the, the very first one is that at the beginning of, of your presentation, and you mentioned the Bunsfield accident, and there's a lot of evidence that some detonation went on on that kind of explosion. They observed some such very high level of, of overpressure, which are not uh, uh, expected for open areas. So one of the gentlemen here, they are asking, uh, he's, a, he's asking uh, whether the code that your work is able to work with detonation. He's just no, assuming no. that the modeling that you have is for deflagration. So, if you want, if you if you could say something about it. Yes. Um, no. Uh, the combustion model I am working with only covers deflagrations, which is when the 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 speed of the flame uh, propagation speed is under the speed of sound. So uh, BML as conceived, um, as firstly conceived, does not cover um, the detonation phases because detonations involved involves a formation of a shock wave and this represents a discontinuation uh, with the flow and to uh, predict, in order to be able to predict those kind of, of uh, this phenomena, we would have also uh, the need for other uh, numerical methods that could account for the, the discontinuities of the flow. Okay. Um, the, the second question goes goes with the software itself. So as far as the software is concerned, uh, the gentleman wants to know whether it's open source and if you could talk a little bit about, about the, the code itself. Yes, the software is a, an open source code and it has been fully developed by researchers uh, from the laboratory I work in. Uh, it has been the result of many years of um, combined efforts and um, it is based on the Reynolds average Navier-Stokes of the transport equations for solving um, turbulence which is modeled with the K epsilon um, approach and we are working with um, improving the results we have so far uh, uh, by working with the combustion model. So my research work is focused mainly on studying the combustion model that is implemented within the code. No, okay. Um, there's, there's a few more questions here. So one of them is, is there any reports in the literature about the transition between laminar and turbulent regimes and explosions? And if so, what kind of criteria do you use for runs simulation? Yes, there is actually one. Um, let me just find it here where I reference, yes. Uh, the one that Stokes, the one that is implemented in Stokes is based on the work of Viana and Kant, and it considers a blend function that is responsible for 
um, transitioning from the laminar propagation to the laminar propagation, and it uses as a, uh, the Reynolds number, the turbulent rain, Reynolds number, as a um, parameter to to um, to determine this transition from laminar to turbulent burning models. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before. Before we move on to the next question, uh, I would like to let you know there's one compliment from the YouTube. It comes from Professor Marianne from, uh, from the School of Chemical Engineering at uh, Unicamps. She is very happy with your presentation and she would like to congratulate you for putting this together. So I, Thank you. I thought it would be nice to let you know. Well, uh, we have quite a few questions, actually. So the next one is um, it's about the software again. In the presentation, you talked about premixed gas combustion. Can you use the same implementation to simulate non-premixed combustion? Well, I believe we could use uh, the same framework, the, the, the same CFD code, but we would have to change the combustion model. Because BML, as I was explaining over the, the presentation, is um, used to predict and to model premixed combustion and mainly turbulent premixed combustion. So we would have yeah. to change the combustion model into another one. Okay. Um, there's one more question. Um, someone is asking. Uh, if you have an idea, it could be a ballpark figure if you want, but how much a software like this uh, the user should expect to cost? Well, <laughs> we have a commercial, a similar commercial software that is available, and uh, I think it's the market leader in simulating. Um, explosions which is called flax we normally also compare this the the results we have from stokes with flax simulation and i'm afraid uh, if i'm not mistaken flax license costs i don't know a hundred thousand dollars a year if i'm not mistaken yeah so uh if we were to improve Stokes, uh, and that we are trying to do here to become as competitive as flags, if the license for using it would be um, in the same range, right? Yeah. Good. Well, there's there's one one more question here. Actually, it's a very good one. I think I'm not saying that the other ones were not good, but this is someone that really hit me in the in the nose, if you wish. But uh, that comes from one of the graduate students, also from from the School of Chemical Engineering. So he's asking, do you think that LES approach could improve the results, and will it be possible to use it on a large scale? Uh, application well um the the only limitation we have nowadays for using les um approach and also dns dns approaches is the limitation of the the um is the computational limitation right the, the hardware the um, uh, the capabilities of a computer so we expect we, we are already living um, a, a situation, a moment where LES is becoming more, um, how can I say that, more used, more applied in large scale geometries, but it's still very um, in its early uh, stages of application in, in real life situations. And the reason for that is only uh, a computational, because of a computational limitation, right? So as computers become more fast and 
its capabilities of processing and well dealing with large amounts of data are developed uh, in the future we would probably have les and dns even being applied in more complex um, uh, flows um, Tasia, when we when we look at the validation that you have presented we can see some discrepancies in between the experimental data and and your numerical findings so in terms of les actually the, the question that i just forward to you actually we have two questions in one in one question so i, I think you have addressed the second bit which uh, when that would be available to run les to compute explosion on large scale experiments and stuff like that but the very first bit of the question actually goes to the fact that the the gentleman wants to know whether LES would help to improve your results. And I am just assuming that when I look at the slide that you have on the screen, we can see some differences in between the experimental data and, and, uh, and the numerical findings. Obviously, there's loads of reasons for that. But do you think, in your opinion, that whether you go LES, that would help to improve those results? Yes, yes, of course. Um, we have in literature, um, well, in, with, in, sim in comparing, when comparing CFD results uh, from the results of literature, we normally resort to both empirical, uh, empiric results, right, which come from uh, experiments, but we also rely on LES simulation and DNS simulations because they can obtain a level of information that can, uh, can be used to improve the models we already have. So in the past, for example, let me just go back here a little bit. So, for example, we have a number of adjustable constants uh, that are used in the BML module. So, in the past, uh, literature suggested that, for example, the range uh, um, that CL could vary were from uh, 1 to... Um, two, right, in the range from one to two. But now with further DNS and LES data, uh, we, have that, uh, we have evidence that supports that this range, this range um, is not, uh, well, fully um, correct. So we normally rely on LES and DNS uh, simulations to try to improve models we already have that are uh, less computational, computationally expensive, such as the run approach. Mm -hmm. uh, we probably have one, one final question here, which is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to translate, but if something goes uh, we all know that in the very near future, we need to move on and try to somehow avoid some of the combustion engines and stuff like that. So there's a lot of good evidence that the hydrogen will be used more and more frequently. And as chemical engineers, we, we all know from the refineries that the range of flammability of the hydrogen is quite large. And there's some par particularities on the reactivity of the hydrogen itself. So people are asking whether you can adapt your code or whether you can change some of the source terms in terms of the combustion rate to address hydrogen uh, burning. Yes, uh, in theory, the uh, BML can be used to, to predict deflagrations uh, of hydrogen. Again, the the code and the combustion model could not um, predict detonations. We would have to make other modifications in the code to address detonation. And what happens with hydrogen is that the likelihood 
uh, for the explosion to develop into a detonation, which is the flame propagating um, above, right, the speed of sound, uh, we would have to, to make another modifications. So speaking of um, deflagrations with hydrogen, we would probably need um, certain specific properties of hydrogen, uh, such as the laminar flamelet speed that we would insert here in this term, um, and also make another adjustment on the constants of the model. Uh, one more, uh, it says maybe that's sort of a more uh, philosophical question, if you wish, but it seems as if we are all stardust, and that comes from supernova, which would be essentially the end of the life of a particular star, and we can treat it as a chemical, a nuclear chemical reactor in some sense. So uh, the lady is asking you actually whether is there any similarities um, on the terms uh, of the explosions that you were modeling and the explosion of a star, more precisely a supernova. Well, I haven't studied uh, supernova, um, the phenomenon itself, but it, it's actually a turbulent combustion. So the, the turbulent flame interaction and the, the understanding of the underlying concepts uh, of the turbulent flame interaction is actually what we, where we struggle the most in order to, to be able to predict this kind of phenomenon from a numerical point of view. Um, and they, even though we have achieved many advances in understanding the phenomena over the past decades, um, we still don't fully comprehend all the phenomena involved in this uh, concerns, concerns from supernova to explode to accidental gas explosions so they are related of course because you have combustion you have turbulence um, but there are uh, research opportunities to those who want to continue on this investigation path yeah oh, that is fantastic well um there seems someone is typing something here on my WhatsApp, so I'm just just waiting a little bit whether that would be a compliment or a question or maybe something else. But in the meantime, I would like to thank you again for putting this together, such a lovely presentation. Thank you. I would like also to take the opportunity to invite all the other researchers which, which are following us on the YouTube if uh, uh, there's a very good opportunity to practice some of the your presentation skills, the, the English uh, speaking and listening, and also it's a good chance to prepare you for, for seminars and for presentations that you may have to deliver in a particular conference. That's much of your reality, uh, particularly for those who, we are, who are PhD students. Okay, so I have one more question here. Uh, so this will be the last one, I promise. Uh, the question goes like this. What algorithm was used to discretize the advective term on the turbulence equations? Will be a second order upwind the best for this case? So two questions. The first one, the gentleman wants to know what was the numerical scheme on the advection term? Um, for the transport equations of turbulence. And at the same time, he asked us, well, if the second order upwind would be, uh, would be better for, for, for this particular case. Yeah, the code is fully, um, uh, well, the central difference scheme is the, the discretization method, which is being used in the whole code. So um, my research 
is concerned with the combustion model, but I'm sure a higher order discretization scheme, such as, I don't know, um, W, N, and upwind schemes would probably be uh, more accurate in um, trying to, to describe the phenomena we are dealing here with, but we also need to pay attention to the computational costs involved when implementing higher or higher order schemes. Okay. Yeah, one, one of the things that I feel tempted to say is that what if we go for upwind schemes, second order upwind schemes, that would be something interesting in the sense that we would be able to keep the same order of accuracy and at the same time reduce the necessity for artificial viscosity, which is goes through this move factor, which is a big, a big pain in the neck. So, uh, but definitely uh, the W you know scheme it's very promising, particularly for capturing the discontinuities. And I, I I tend to agree with you that that would be the best option at the moment. Having said that, it comes with a higher computational cost, so that's the price we have to pay. But even with the second-order upwind schemes and, and, and central schemes, there's some sort of discontinuities that we are not able to capture unless we have a very refined mesh. So if we go with a W, you know, at the same time, we can have the same level of accuracy, but we can use coarser mesh. So it's definitely worth investing. What would be the, the benefits and the cost of having the swap in between the two approaches? But that's a very good question. Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Philippe. For what that, that was sent by Philip Mendes, which is one of our colleagues. Uh, very, very interesting. But well, uh, uh, we we are approaching an hour now. Uh, so I guess people they they have lectures in the afternoon. And again, I would like to thank you very much. Of putting this together i would like also to thank you people from the internet well i'm not really monitoring this but the last time i saw we have over 20 people uh, watching and yeah yeah i'm back i'm back i'm back i guess i'm back yeah oh okay uh, so that's it i would like to thank you all and i would like to invite uh, the people to to join us and in the next time just drop us a line that this was developed and concept and tailored for you thank you thank you uh, uh tasia and also i would like to there's a lot of people work on the background to make this possible so rodrigo um maria fernanda um, danielle please accept my big hug and thank you very much oops these are the people that are on the backstage, so we don't really know uh, what they're doing, but without that support, that, that would never be possible. So thank you very much indeed for, for helping us. I guess this is all from my side. Uh, I hope to see you next time. You guys take care and have a lovely weekend.